podcast you're about to listen to is from a book series on post-qualitative, new materialist and critical post-humanist research. I'm Karen Murris and chief editor of this new Radlich series. You can find it on the following website, www.postqualitativeresearch.com. My name is Christy Stone. I am the author of Chapter 7, Indian Ocean Sea Beans, Affective Methods in Museum Archives. This chapter on the Indian Ocean Sea Beans is one of four object studies that forms the basis of my research on sacred and powerful objects which are stored in museum collections under the colonial categories of charm or talisman. The other objects are a Shimshan soul catcher, a Bushman hunting bag and a protective azimut found in the possession of runaway slaves in the Cape. Although these objects are housed in archival collections in Cape Town, they have, all, they have come from all over the world and therefore, according to current museum theory, the first question we may ask is whether these objects should be returned to their so-called source communities. In this podcast, I will be discussing how this chapter on the Indian Ocean sea beans fits into my inquiry into museum objects stored as charms. This quickly brings me to the larger discussion of the challenges and concerns facing museums currently, that of return and, and reparation. This chapter is in some senses a response to the questions facing museums and I conclude by highlighting what affective research methods, and in this case an oceanic method, might bring to these debates. In the context of museums, the most significant shift in best practice to date came with the release of the Feline Soir and Benedict Savoy report on the restitution of African cultural heritage in 2018. This report, commissioned by French President Emmanuel Macron, has had a profound impact on the discourse surrounding the return of artworks in museums. By highlighting the historical injustices and colonial legacies associated with many museum collections, the report has sparked a global conversation on the ethical responsibility of institutions to repatriate cultural treasures to their countries of origin. Its recommendations have catalyzed efforts towards a more equitable and inclusive approach to the display and ownership of artworks, acknowledging the need for restitution and fostering a dialogue on shared cultural heritage. As a result, it might seem that the correct course of action for museums who house sacred and ceremonial objects is to initiate or at least to signal their intention to return and repatriate these items. Dan Hicks, curator at the Pitt Rivers Museum, Oxford, is a leading advocate for the repatriation of cultural artefacts, especially ta those taken by colonial explo exploitation. In order to facilitate the process of return, he maintains that a curator's principal role needs to be focused on writing object death histories, what he terms necographies in order to know the collection's intricacies and to facilitate object return where it is demanded. Object death histories highlight their connection to colonial military attacks, looting and acts of violence, revealing the disciplines of anthropology and archaeology's complicity in perpetuating white supremacy. While I am in full agreement with Hicks and the Saar and Savoy report that sacred objects and artworks need returning as a matter of urgency, I also find myself feeling that something is missing, and this something, I believe, is an engagement with objects themselves as powerful or lively. Scholars advocating for the return of artworks as part of the decolonial project, in general, remain objectively detached from the objects they study, and therefore the museums in forming ontologies and epistemologies remain largely invisible or intact. What is needed therefore is a new researcher position, which I believe the methods of affect, which includes the oceanic, bring to the fore. 
This larger question of how we relate to objects is best explained by Matisse artist and, and scholar David Garner, who, citing bell hooks, explains that while there is an abundance of literature about Indigenous art by non-Indigenous writers, and this writing may offer learning about the history, society, political, and occasionally even engage the aesthetic framework, these texts very rarely include an account of the author's subjective engagement engagement with an indigenous object. There are very few accounts of how the researcher was moved, touched, taken to another place, momentarily born again. While Garner acknowledges that there is some possibility that this was not their experience, he argues that it is more probable that these subjective confessions lie outside of a rational framework and are therefore not considered to be important to the knowledge-making process. What Garner and Hooks are referring to is the importance of fostering a different aesthetic encounter with objects as a means of resisting colonial ways of knowing. In Garner's words, if the metaphysical qualities of these things are not recognized as essential properties, as facts, then suddenly they become available for appropriation. Importantly then, inquiries into aesthetics object liveliness and affect broaden current and often oversimplified discussions of restitution and return. As South African historian Siraj Rousseau argues, the transformation is a process that cannot be rushed. Sorry, the transformation of the museum is a process that cannot be rushed. The end point is not about having all objects returned. It is the state of transition that is important messiness, uncertainty, and not knowing what it will result in. In Rasul's words, return sets up a new agenda as to how we remake ourselves, a new ethics and a new kind of person. And in light of these challenges, how can researchers, museums, and other knowledge producers take these objects and their informing ontological systems seriously? Or more directly, I ask, what does it mean for me to engage these objects as lively? In order to begin to research differently or outside of a positive paradigm, I argue that there are two important things to consider, and these are some of the driving questions in my own work. What is, a what is the researcher position in relation to charms? Are they to be considered objects or are they to be understood as subjects, as living in some way or lively and able to affect the world? If they are subjects, does one's sense of responsibility towards them change? And secondly, when working with objects of power, we need to ask, are silences empty? And should secrets be captured? Thinking about objects in such a uh, Thinking about objects as holding secrets might encourage, might encourage us to ask what informs our feelings of entitlement to know, and by extension, should all knowledge be exposed, or is there a counter-ethic to notions of scientific omnipotence? And this leads me to the oceanic method as a means of engaging objects differently and reassessing knowledge creation. An oceanic method is thus put forward as a methodological tool that introduces the ideas of nomadacy and of movement and exchange, and in so doing, destabilizes land-based notions of identity and indigeneity. Exploring oceanic methods as an embodied and affective scholarly practice, I organize this chapter according to Anna Singh's concept of a rush of stories. Following this method and guided by the bean, I explore the rich and lively botanical, cultural and historical aspects of the stories as a counterpoint to reductive biomedical sciences and outdated mononarratives. Importantly, this chapter comes through a process of material relating and as a result, I explore my own learnings through illness, ancestral ties, and plant consciousness. Thank you for listening to this podcast. If you would like to know more about this chapter, please visit the website 
www.postqualitativeresearch.com. And please stay tuned for future podcasts.